Welcome. We're going to get started with the uh, master plan presentation. Uh, my name is Paul Pinkston, Director of Facilities here. And we started this uh, Residence Life master plan process uh, earlier this year, back in January. Um, we're going to show you a high level view of the physical uh, space of Residence Life. Um, Epstein Ewan is the design architect for this, and they have some uh, sub consultant, the Scion Group that did some financial data and modeling. So uh, this will run, their presentation's about an hour, and they'll run through a slide presentation. After that, we'll have a Q&A session, and uh, they'll answer anything you, that uh, you have questions on. And uh, they'll be paraphrasing your questions since there's no microphone for the audience, uh, just so you understand that. So it's recorded. And this presentation will then be uh, put on our website for people who weren't able to attend. So. Uh, with that, I'll introduce uh, Jonathan Parker, uh, architect from Epstein Ewan, and uh, he will go ahead and start. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today to uh, uh, listen to what we have to say and, and hopefully uh, interact with us a little bit. Um, again, we're going to uh, go through a presentation um, with these topics to, to give you a big picture view of uh, uh, the uh, housing master plan that we've helped put together. Uh, again, I'm Jonathan Parker. I'm an architect with Epstein Ewan Architects. We do a lot of student housing design uh, in our firm. And uh, with us today are some of our partners on the consulting end of it, and starting with uh, you. Why not? Uh, introduce yourself, stand up. Inter oh, Thanks. <laughs> Mike? All right, and uh, we also have uh, in the group um, OTI uh, design uh, to help us w with a little bit of um, of uh, civil engineering and of course we uh, worked uh, very closely with representatives from the state of Wisconsin uh, uh, DFDM uh, as well as UW system and then representatives from housing so we have uh, had a very um, collaborative process going together uh, for this project I'll move that down a bit so again, um, what, what were we uh, hired to do and, and, and also fill in a little bit what we weren't hired to do. So uh, what we were trying to accomplish was providing a master plan for uh, uh, housing and student life to follow to, to understand uh, how to meet current needs and future needs and what those needs are and, and how those might uh, manifest themselves into to physical um, uh, buildings as well as um, operational uh, ideas. Um, we were asked to investigate existing conditions, um, not in terms of very in-depth uh, building condition type of review. Uh, do we need a coat of paint? Do we need a new water heater? It was more uh, the configuration of the existing facilities, uh, both internally and uh, in terms of how they're sited in the, in the campus and how they do or do not relate well to the academic side of the campus. Um, uh, we also were asked to look at uh, uh, kind of on the business side of things, um, where is the demand going uh, in this campus? Is, 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 there, is demand increasing? Is demand decreasing? And, and how does that demand look different across the different division levels for students? First year demand is different than uh, fourth year demand and that sort of thing. And that was an important part of what we were looking at. Uh, we also were asked to advise on uh, financial modeling. Uh, and help make a business case. So uh, understanding that a housing utility needs to be um, uh, self-sustaining uh, financially, um, we also were part of the process of, of building that financial model, looking at first costs, looking at operational costs, looking at uh, revenues coming in and looking at demand. So um, again, more than just brick and mortar. Uh, and then working with everybody uh, over the last several months, we've had a lot of ideas being generated um, but ultimately, what, what do we recommend? What, what is the direction to go to? So um, again, uh, the process was to engage with stakeholders, and that is a broad array of individuals, um, uh, not just uh, our consulting team, not just housing, but uh, other uh, representatives from various divisions of campus, uh, as well as the state of Wisconsin and UW system. 
Um, setting goals early on so we were understanding what we were and were not doing uh, in the process. Um, and so what we were trying to do is come up with a master plan, understanding how, how your operations are being conducted right now, what's good about them, what could use some improvement, um, and then make some recommendations for a, 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 a direction to go to. What we weren't hired to do was design a new residence hall and get that bid and built. So that will happen in the future, but we were hoping, uh, we, our, our design task was to, to look more strategically and, and help you with strategic direction in terms of housing. So in doing that, we, uh, we did look at some site and building options for the purposes of discussing where they might go, how those buildings might solve some problems, um, and what those buildings might cost, both first cost and operationally. Uh, so that we could, again, give you advice on, on how to solve some problems and how to make that financially feasible, um, getting into the financial models, uh, and then refine those options. So it was, there, was, there was a lot of give and take, a lot of workshops, a lot of discussion about what we should do and then how does that manifest itself into a recommendation. Um, so uh, I'm not going to read each and every one of these, but uh, core values in, in the vision and mission statement was very important to the group so that we had a roadmap uh, to start with and we had a, an ability to test those ideas against, you know, how well it, it, it uh, um, um, reflects or solves the, some of these um, uh, uh, visions and values. Um, so data gathering, uh, certainly spent uh, a lot of time understanding uh, your campus, your campus's position in the state and in, in near the, uh, the, the city of Green Bay. So a lot of this you might look at and say, well, we know that, um, but uh, as, as a consultant, we don't know it as well as you do. So we did need to understand uh, that dynamic between campus and the um, and the city understand uh, how the campus connects to the city in terms of public transportation, private transportation. Uh, you know, is there a separation? Is there a connection? And from the housing standpoint, that that speaks to um, off-campus housing, office ca uh, off-campus housing availability and location, and how the off-campus housing experience positively or negatively impacts the students' success on campus. Right. So we have to understand that dynamic and recognizing that that you are a relatively uh, suburban campus um, there's not you know you don't go across the street and there's there's a ton of rental housing availability for students right so how does that factor into our recommendations um, one of the other things that that were really important to understand is um, the uh, of high property so the university uh, village housing property that public private partnership property versus the state of wisconsin property and so looking at, at development options um, first cost operational cost uh, timing of implementation is quite a bit different for a building that's out in here versus a building that's in here so it's it's one of those interesting um, uh, opportunities that you have on this campus that other campuses typically don't have. Typically a campus only has a choice of, of a state funded project and that is a much longer timeline than a, a potentially public private process. So so there's a dynamic there too in, in understanding how we plan out these buildings and how it's relative to those um, those property lines is, is important. So uh, again, your, your current housing plan uh, uh, is such that you have buildings that are both on state property and not on state property. And, and we need to understand those and, and understand how they operate, how they're configured, what their lifespan is, what the potential um, process is going forward to potentially uh, either keep those or replace those. Um, so we did study the, 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 the basic condition of those, basic location of those. Um, basic configuration of that of that housing um, uh, to to understand the the existing stock. These are um, images from the housing website um, uh, to to give you some uh, understanding of what's going on there. And and I think that that pointing out some of the things like the apartment 3312 configuration doesn't have any common space in it, and and we wanted to talk about 
that lack of comment space and what that does to the sense of community in those particular facilities, how we look beyond just the living arrangement and understand the academic con connection and the social connection that is an important part of a student housing experience and where we might be able to improve that in terms of building um, a replacement. So again, uh, uh, just recognizing that, that there's this other interesting layer of, of planning and, and project opportunity uh, for this process, then I'm not sure that everybody understands that or realizes that there's, there's that different property line and, and there's different rules that apply to, to, the, to the way you develop uh, student housing, whether you're on the pink property or the green property. So. Um, Understanding the circulation right now uh, is fairly um, organic and uh, um, uh, it, 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 it doesn't really form a, a strong connection between housing and the rest of the academic campus at this point in time. It's, it's sort of past where people walk more typically. Is there a way to improve? That connection is their way to uh, make more interesting th things happening outside the buildings that, that are gathering spaces as well. There's certainly opportunity there. Understanding where the parking is, understanding the cost of parking, the location of parking, um, the availability of parking um, is another factor that's important when we're looking at student housing and, and uh, uh, cost, first cost, demand satisfaction, that sort of thing. So again, um, the, the process and in, in the goals, uh, uh, we, we, it was a very collaborative process. We, we did have the opportunity to come up here and meet with, with several different groups and have different conversations with those groups, explore different ideas um, in, in various different methodologies. So um, you know, again, we're, we're not working in a vacuum. We're, we're making sure we understand what, uh, what you're doing here on campus. Um, also had the opportunity to talk about what other people are doing on similar campuses. How are they addressing student housing? Um, and, and then start to focus on, okay, where do we want to go from here? What are those uh, project questions and uh, objectives? Uh, and where do we go with this? So uh, I'm going to have Mike talk a little bit about uh, some of the findings that Scion have, have uh, come up with on the project, and, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the methodology for gathering this data as well, Mike, if you want to come up and... Take over to Mike. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I, I, someone in a student development background, I just want to point out, there's a lot of research that shows the people that sit in the first six rows of large lecture theaters tend to get better grades and everything. So I <laughs> just want to give that as an FYI to the folks hiding out at the back there. <laughs> okay, so some of the things that Scion did when we came in here, part of our role was to get in and do a demand study to figure out, um, do an examination of the housing you have now, less from a facilities end um, other than general design issues um, and how the students are interacting with it, but also from how many students would like to live on campus um, as first-year students looking at your enrollment projections, but also as returning students. If you had enough beds, and if you, had, if you had more beds and what kinds of beds, how many students would like to stay here? And then also comparing that to what your off-campus market is like in terms of availability as well as price. Uh, to f kind of find the sweet spot of if you created new housing here, how much could you create and have it filled? Um, and you know, to make it financial. And then later on, we did the financial modeling to see what would work and the different types of ways to build it. Um, so we started out with your enrollment projections, and that came from the campus, with undergraduate enrollment set to increase to 5705 by fall 2022. Um, and that was based on a 2% increase. And the numbers that we're working with for housing are all full-time headcount numbers. So you may hear other references to things like full-time equivalent. Well, when you're working on housing, equivalent can't sleep in a bed. You need to actually have the headcount because those are the specific people that are going to sign up for housing. So those are the numbers that we're working with. And then you've also got graduate enrollment increasing some up to 145 students by that same time period. You've had waiting lists in the past for student housing, and this was a snapshot of the last time there was uh, through the housing application where the waiting process was. Um, so there is demand there that right now you aren't able to meet, especially in terms of the first year students. And that was something that people were concerned about. First year students wanting to have housing and not having enough space. And then also first year students ending up in space that probably isn't 
from a developmental standpoint and a community development standpoint probably isn't best suited for them and best suited for them anyways. So you were able to stick them into some places, but it wasn't the place you would most ideally like to have first year students in. And one of the things that we did was a campus wide survey. And uh, this was really interesting around here. It was 94% of the survey respondents were interested in newer, um, newer renovated student housing on your campus. And that matched up very well to things that we discussed with students in person. So we were here for about three days. It was myself, uh, Fatima, and Chelsea were all here for three days. I, we were set up in front of the dining hall with a huge whiteboard, getting questions and interacting with people. The survey was going on. We did focus groups. I went to, I can't remember the acronyms, IRC, IHC, IRHC, the student, the student leadership group. RHA, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I've been on so many campuses, they're all called different things. So I went to the Res Hall Association meeting, um, had meetings with all the different staff within the campus as well as different stakeholders on the campus that are connected to housing. The one thing that came out really loud and clear was the students that live on campus enjoy it. They have a good experience here. Um, there are really good programs and activities and f a feeling of connection and community for the students that are living here. And that also came through for the students who don't live here anymore and or never had a chance to live here. They wanted to have a chance to live here if they didn't get it, even if they were local. A lot of them talked about it would have been great if I could live on campus. Um, for some of the locals, it's a concern of money. For some others, it was just a concern of space. And a lot more returners would like to stay on campus if there was space, which was also something that was a compliment to what you've got going on here and also something to consider with possibilities for building. So some of the things we found um, UW-Green Bay has got the lowest housing rates by quite a significant margin in the UW system. And we'll have a chart that shows some of the comparables in that. So in terms of thinking about future, future projects, there's, there's room to grow with rates before you even get close to being at the most expensive end of the Wisconsin schools. You've been operating at or above about 89% occupancy for almost a decade. And for your off-campus market, um, quite a bit different from a lot of other schools that face a lot of competition with their off-campus market. Most of the students that live off-campus, there's a large percentage that are living because that's living in a place that's their family home, and the students who are moving here or once they leave residence, the off-campus housing market is not very close to where the campus is. There's one project that's nearby, and otherwise there's quite a gap between here and where most of your students live if they're not living on the campus. So then did all of, all of the different studies, all the different surveys, all the feedback and focus groups from the students and the staff and faculty, looking at your numbers, your occupancy rates for your enrollment projections. And we're trying to come up to what is the demand for student housing here on campus. So whatever you're going to build, is it going to end up being 95% full going forward so it can be financially feasible and the students enjoy it and it works for the campus. And because of where, where the priorities were here, we actually came up with a few different demand scenarios depending on what you wanted to do, especially knowing that the housing may need to be phased in in projects. So that's why you see three different numbers here related to demand. So by the time you get to 2022, we've got three scenarios here. Your unmet demand in terms of the shortfall for your first year housing. So if you go to a housing, um, a housing requirement for first year students and you put you know, some level of, of discernment depending on where they live. So you'll likely be some, kind, some degree of a circle around the campus. And if you live within the circle, you don't mandatorily have to live on campus. So if you get to 75 to 80% of the first year class living on campus, by the time 2022 rolls around, you're gonna have an unmet demand in terms of beds that you don't have for your first year students of 190 to 256. The shortfall you're going to have if you want to be able to keep 60% of your current residents and have them be able to stay in housing into their second and third years and fourth years, so you're going to be 152 beds shy. But your, your shortfall, and this was the most interesting one, and this reflects how much the students want to live on campus in terms of their housing options here. If you actually break it out to instead of being able to house 60% of the returning of the students that want to come back to housing, if you get it to just looking at your second to fourth year students and housing all of them that want to stay, and when I say want to stay, I don't just mean clicking yes on a survey. I mean based on their preferences, based on price points and price sensitivities, comparing the markets on and off campus, you get up to 456. And that's a lot of uh, housing that can be created 
that is very likely to be filled with your students from second to fourth year that right now doesn't exist. So these are the numbers in terms of unmet beds, unmet demand for beds that you would have by the time you get to 2022. And then we get into some of the financial modeling. And here are some of the things that those assumptions are based on. Um, the most obvious one and most important one is the occupancy rate. So these are modeled off a 95% occupancy with summer revenue factored in there, ancillary revenues, and what the rental rates are, are projected as. Um, so rental rates, we, you know, working with the campus, we came up with a few different samples and a few different scenarios to figure those out. Um, the expense assumptions come from a combination of Scion's experience, because Scion owns about 61,000 beds off-campus housing around the country. Um, numbers that, here, that come from this campus in terms of your operating expenses, and then we also review those, um, my, folks like myself and Linda Newman at Zion review those things. And I've been a housing director for 20 years before I started doing consulting work full time. So we're reviewing those numbers too to make sure that they make sense. Um, so those expense assumptions are, are fairly solid. And then the project cost assumptions, depending on whether it's done through uh, an of high style construction process through a public private partnership with those numbers or a DFDM that's done it th doing it through the state the debt equity ratios and the total project costs. So the peer comparisons where I mentioned that you were among the least expensive, um, we looked at the three schools that you identified as the ones you most compete for students with, and you can see the difference in their rental rates for student housing compared to yours. So 12.5% less than Stevens Point, 13.5% less than Oshkosh, and 3.3% less than Whitewater. And so you're positioned really well financially in terms of your rates to still compete with them, going into the future and if anybody didn't project we projected out a three and a half percent rate increase is what they would try to do uh, but they were all these three schools were all posted and then we have a, have a longer list that had some schools that didn't have it posted um, but compared to everybody in the state you are the least expensive of the st of the state schools so there's room to grow in terms of rates and so we tested a various uh, various models of different styles of of uh, construction projects through a master plan, option A, B, and C, um, with different amounts of first year housing, different amounts of, of second year housing, and third and fourth year housing. Some of these models involve demolishing some of what's there and rebuilding, others of it involve renovating what's there and upgrading it, and we'll get more into the specifics of each of the plans as, as it goes through. And option C and D, uh, in terms of financial feasibility with debt coverage ratios and everything else, whether it's done DFDM or whether it's done through an OVHI model, they both come out financially feasible to make sense. So it, it, the project will pay for itself over the, over the course of time with enough money coming in to take care of the buildings over the course of time as well. So in the other options, that doesn't mean A and B are bad options. That just means in terms of the financial feasibility, we'd have to do a little bit more uh, looking into ways that it, they could be adjusted to make sense. I am not going to go, th go through every single one of these little boxes, and this is only one small summary slide of the financial models, but to give you an idea of the depth of the financial modeling, um, this is the kinds of things we would go through to look at the different sizes of buildings, going through all of the different expenses, what the total costs are going to be, what the total management fees are going to be. Uh, so there's quite a bit of depth in terms of the financial modeling of all the different projects. And this gets into the sizes of the buildings, the gross square footage, the money per square foot, the total cost, and the per bed costs. Um, they may sound like really high numbers, but I can tell you from working across the US and Canada, for new construction for housing, those are right around the ballpark of most places. To build something of quality that's going to be around and last, and you can be proud to stick your name on it, that's how much new housing costs. Oh, sorry. And the one of them was the doing it as an of high approach, and one of us doing it as a DFDM approach. And you notice the difference in the costs. Um, that has a lot to do with what type of the building, what type of building you're putting up. So there are differences. You can have differences in quality of construction, and also with an of high approach, that's making it similar to what the, the building styles that are there now. You don't have to have that kind of building style with an of high approach or a P3 approach. It can be done with a different style as well. 
And this gets into the control and risk, which is the differences between if you're going to do something state-owned versus doing something through a public-private partnership. The decision to do one or the other is based on a handful of factors. The most obvious ones are who's controlling it, who's got all of the risk. Um, another factor that comes into, into that is how fast does it get built. And so the, the campus, if in terms of making those decisions, part of it is about money, but also part of it is about risk and control and what you're comfortable with and where the balances are. And does your demand profile for the study, does that bode well for you getting really competitive bids if you decide to go with a public-private partnership model? Because um, if you did not have a solid demand model, even though a P3 model you know, on paper might seem to make a lot of sense, you're not likely to get a lot of bids um, and have people interested in it. But your demand model is very solid. Your, the success that you've already had is very strong. And this is a campus that isn't going anywhere. It's been a, a campus with a success rate for a long period of time. So the chances of finding partners to work with you are pretty high. But then you balance out all those other things around risk and control to see which one you want to do the most. And pass it back over to Jonathan. Thanks, Mike. So, uh, having said all of that, what are what are the recommendations that that uh, we are making? Um, come on now. Um, so, one, two, and three, the the kind of the big picture uh, items there is is replacing that that uh, first year of freshman housing that that really has inadequate uh, community space. Um, that that there, there's some facilities that just from a configuration standpoint could could really stand to be improved. Um, uh, certainly meeting the demand uh, for the upper division housing is an opportunity for you. You've got a lot of people that want to live here on campus, um, and, and why not address that demand? Uh, and then lastly is improving the site connections uh, between housing district and the academic district. Um, how do we feel more like a connected campus as opposed to the academic side and the housing side? So we're going to talk through uh, some design options for that going forward. Um, Again, Mike had talked about uh, some of the, the housing options that we tested in the financial modeling, and uh, um, those will start to manifest themselves in the, in the design options that I'm going to have uh, Paul and Jared talk about going forward. What you see is really, this is a process slide. So there, there's two process slides before we get to some of the building opportunities you have in your residential neighborhood. And this is a really useful tool with the steering committee early on because those, we really cut out little squares that represented sizes of the buildings. And then we also, those grayer blocks you see are the existing buildings. Is the green button the... Uh, so that, that's, this is, represents the union. So early on, we're really looking at building placement. Where are we put in the buildings? Where's the parking? Where's the cars? Where are people walking? How can we reinforce a connection from the residential areas back to the academic part of campus? Where are we put in the parking? You know, is there an opportunity to bring the arboretum into the whole development. How can we maintain your green space? How can we enhance your green space? How can those spaces in between the buildings, uh, Jonathan and Mike had talked about those social spaces. I mean, there, we have to have social spaces inside the buildings, but that also extends to the exterior of the building as well. So this first option, we said, okay, what if we take a look at placing the, at the residential density closest to the academic part of campus, and then we just let the perimeter you know, evolve as, as time permits. Well, the second option, we started to think, okay, maybe that's not quite the solution. Let's really take a closer look at those, the of high property and the state property and see what kind of opportunities are there and kind of maintain that Phoenix Park, that green space between the residential any academic, and then how can we bring the arboretum in? And you see those blue circles? Those represent nodes, because as we go through a master plan process and we take all that information that Mike and his group is developing and providing to us, we need to be aware of paths. You know, what are the car paths? What are the people paths? What are the nodes, right? Those blue intersections between the cars and the people. What are the neighborhoods? Where are the freshmen living? Where are the sophomores living? Where are the upperclassmen? 
and, and how are they associated with one another? What's happening on the edges? Where's your parking? How are people getting to it? And what are landmarks within it? How do I know where I'm going? When I get to the residential district, how do I know where I have to go to my residence hall? How do I know where I get to the, to the residential parts? These are all things that go through and part of that planning process that we talk about with the steering committee. One of the things we learned from the survey, and this is important, and Jonathan mentioned we don't go into design. We take it as far as this, because when you see the blocks on the site, we need to have an understanding how many students are in the buildings and what kind of living arrangements do they prefer. So this really just represents the difference in living arrangements between the freshmen and the upperclassmen. On the far left, you have the freshmen, so it's a double occupancy room with a shared bathroom. And then you bring all these together, and we figure out how many people are in a building, and then we can also come up with a metric to decide how much common space do you need to accommodate those neighborhoods inside your building. And then you see it just changes as you go up to the upperclassmen, where you'll have the sophomore buildings, you have the four beds with the shared restroom facilities, but then the upperclassmen, and you have some of this on campus now, where you'll have the, the living space, living space and the, and the kitchen and the, the residence rooms, private rooms. So this first option you'll see, and I'll talk a little bit about the building placement on the site, and then Jared will go a little bit more into the site planning issues and some of that a little bit more detail. So you had seen from the survey that the biggest need right now is that 400 bed freshman hall. And there is a number on the lower left talking about the state process and the private process. Again, we're not gonna go into detail about that. That's just there to illustrate. When you go through the state process, it typically might take about five years to go through getting the project approved by the state, doing the interviewing and getting the project done. That quicker time frame is in the private environment it's typically a much quicker process. There's a little bit of a streamlined opportunity there. So then this also represents, uh, you know, you have the of high property in the red, and then everything else is state-owned property. So that first phase, it seemed, and it's really important in, in these diagrams to place those first buildings in the correct location because we need to accommodate flexibility for campus over time. Because we can probably have a pretty good lens you know, what we need in the first couple of years, but you know, we don't know 10 years from now, 15 years from now, how things change. So we have to provide flexibility. So this represents 400 uh, freshman residence halls on that open area between the, the ministry and the, the of high property right now. The second phase, now you'll see some of those existing of high buildings went away. And again, that's really taking a look at those buildings and taking a look, okay, what would it cost to renovate them, right? That's return on investment. So when we're looking at getting that density and bringing those populations together, it makes sense to put the next freshman need right in that central area. And the nice thing about this, the, the housing offices, mail, and other common uh, functions are in that center building, you have the flexibility to, to keep it where it is, or in maybe this second phase freshman res hall, you could place it in there to create that residential center and those common areas inside that new facility. And then again, you know, as you go into this process, you can bring in academic functions as well. Now this represents now the sophomore, right, the next tier, going up to some of the older buildings on campus, then bringing those offline, and then building another sophomore residence hall back there. And then the fourth phase, again, the sophomores are up in that area. So you start to see where we've grouped the freshmen in a center, right, keeping them in a real active, engaged area. And then the sophomores are a little bit, you know, up on the periphery, I, don't, I shouldn't say periphery, but they're a little bit more, you know, replacing those older residence halls. And then coming back to the of high, and then placing the upper class, the junior and senior, in that location. So you see these three populations, and then those pink paths between, and again, Jared will go into more detail about this, we're beginning to create these connections and these green spaces between these different populations and providing those meaningful spaces. And the other thing you have to keep your eye on when you Jerry shows some of his information. We've pushed some of that parking to the perimeter, right? And then we're providing the pedestrian spaces in between the populations. Now the second option, the big difference here, you know, the first two phases would be the same, 
right? The freshman ward is on the open area, putting the next freshman res hall in the middle, but now on that of high property, we put the sophomores, right? So we've tried to group the freshmen and sophomores more central. So you start to see there's these quads or that extension of those social spaces between the buildings because the buildings are very important to help to define that space as well. And then you see the juniors and seniors up on the, uh, I guess in a little bit more private, maybe you know, away from the freshmen and the sophomores. Yeah, and, um, so looking at the, the, the existing environment on the, the campus, there was really um, a big separation where Leon Bond comes through now, connecting to Walter Way. Um, and Phoenix Park and one of the things that we heard was that it, that existing green space was really important and, and we wanted to maintain as much of that. Um, the campus is surrounded by the Arboretum so we also talked about how to bring that uh, into that housing area um, as well um, since that's such a big feature of the campus. Um, and so the the first option um, or that, that same option here looking at uh, removing some of that roadway uh, from this area. So this essentially is all green space in here. Um, there would still be emergency fire access, security access, things like that. Um, but the, uh, the focus would be on pedestrian connection, so wide sidewalks. Um, and then there's this central spine that comes down and through, so connecting the union um, to uh, plaza in the middle here. These would be the freshman halls. Um, and then the sophomores and junior senior up there and so all the parking gets pushed out to this outside and then all these paths that you see these are all bike and pedestrian paths so it moves all that vehicular traffic out um, and creating this central spine will bring all, all the students coming going from the academic core um, down to a central area and so you start having a lot more activities um, social areas planned into that and so people are just seeing each other more there's less of these like side paths that they're taking um, and so there's, there's an opportunity where some of the housing is now um, to have some larger parking lots. So we're still providing um, for the, the commuters and, and the, uh, the upper freshmen that ha or the upperclassmen that have vehicles, um, there's still parking um, available for them, but um, by pushing it out to the outside, the focus is really getting around campus um, by foot or by bike. And um, one of the things that we heard was that um, it seems like things are really far away there you know it's really far to get to um, and and taking the roads takes just as long to get there because there aren't really direct routes and so by creating this central spine and really looking at how things are connected by pathways we can really um, focus those things in and, and shorten the distance um, and then this is that that first option looking at um, creating a larger courtyard bringing all of those spaces together here um, and then so all of this stays the same, and then just this area would be reconfigured, but um, you can see how much more contiguous green space there is, and then all these pathways uh, within it are, are places for people, so all those cars have been, have been pushed out. Um, and then even you know, down in here, looking at, could you remove some of the, the roadways in that area and really make that a people space? Um, and then where this parking is and some of the other parking in here, move that out. Um, to the periphery so that that's that's kind of out of sight okay um, so one of the things we we looked at with that is, is thinking about right now there's kind of a combination of you know a sidewalk ending at a roadway and then it's kind of a, a maintenance road that's also a main path for people um, there's bike paths that are along the side of the road um, and so we look at creating places that invite people that are comfortable for people um, and that take out that, that risk of, of interacting with traffic. And so a lot of the, the concepts in there put the pedestrian crosswalks as a priority. And so there, it's like a raised crosswalk or a pavement change so that that's really visible. Um, moving the, the bike and pedestrian ways off of the main roadway um, so that you reduce those interactions. Um, and you can see there's kind of a difference. So as you get further away from the academic campus, the sidewalks are smaller, but as you get closer in and there's more people, they get bigger to accommodate that. Um, and I'll walk through some images. So this is what, uh, this is what things would look like uh, around the residence hall. So you'd have 
you know, residence hall uh, right outside, there'd be gathering spaces, uh, tables so you could take studying outside. Um, there'd be, you know, some nicer plantings uh, adjacent to a large, that large open green space with mature trees. Um, closer up towards campus, uh, you'd have you know, some spaces like this. Um, you know, maybe outside of the union, there's a, there's a larger plaza for gathering and, and hosting events and things like that. And, and that's at the end of, like, this would be that spine connecting out. And so it's, it's a big collection point for people. And we talk a lot about edges. And so creating those, those pathways along the outside and then having this green space in the middle, there's a lot of opportunity for people to get together, uh, throw a ball around, um, you know, enjoy the nice weather while we have it. And then just, just places for people to hang out to, to see other people and to be seen. Um, and then even some areas like this um, right outside the doors and you know, uh, bicycle parking and, and just really making a nice entrance to the building. And so it's a place where um, people can gather inside, um, but then they, they're also encouraged to gather outside. And then we also looked at the parking. Um, and because parking is so important on this campus, uh, there's ways to improve it aesthetically and environmentally. So um, where there are these large expanses of asphalt, we can look at incorporating the stormwater with native plantings. Um, this is a bioinfiltration area, and so we're taking care of all the stormwater that's running off of that, but we're also creating a lot of nice green space, and so it's, um, it's a little bit uh, more visual with the, the rest of the campus, so taking in some of those more natural areas into the parking areas, and this is just another example of that. So just uh, again, to, to recap what we've talked about, understanding that, that there are some, some big picture needs that need to be addressed, um, uh, making a business case uh, for how to address those needs that's, that's financially sustainable, um, and then uh, uh, coming up with a plan for impl implementation and timing slash uh, phasing. Um, so, uh, you know, looking at, at what does that mean in terms of next steps, um, uh, uh, really deciding uh, which direction campus wants to go and, and having a, uh, uh, an entity that's, that's championing that direction um, and whether it is a, uh, a, a state of Wisconsin approach or an of high approach or a combination thereof, um, uh, uh, deciding upon that and then uh, executing it, understanding the, uh, the timing of obtaining those funding, that funding source, understanding the phasing opportunities. Are you going to do this implementation over the next 40 years or are you going to do it over the next 10 years and what does that mean financially? Um, at, at uh, understanding that, uh, that approach, uh, obtaining the funding um, and then getting uh, an, uh, a designer on board, uh, architects and engineers to actually design the projects, whether it's the first year housing or, or upper division housing, sophomore housing, whatever combination thereof and whatever kind of site uh, uh, elements are involved in that, uh, constructing the building and occupying it. So if you saw the timelines when Paul was talking about his slides, you were looking at those and, and perhaps some of you noticed that that the of high increment was sort of every three years and the state of wisconsin was every five years and so you can imagine that if, if you're doing six seven buildings once every five years that uh, ultimately that's that's a pretty long timeline to get things implemented so again as a group uh strategically you need to make a, a decision about uh, uh how quickly you can or would like to uh, implement the project so um, questions? No fair to not ask any questions. I'm going to ask you to ask me a question. All right, so Green Bay, uh, Phoenix, guy in the sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's an excellent question, and we did talk about that a lot uh, during the design and, and conceptualizing phases. And so there, 
is an opportunity to do that. Um, I think that as, as you talk about strategically what direction uh, you want to go as a campus, um, understanding uh, our, our recommendation of the importance of having those community spaces, those socialization spaces, that's not just specifically for a building but, but also for a housing district or neighborhood. How do we build that into uh, uh, either uh, 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 the housing that is, is being built and having a mini commons, if you will, over there? Uh, or whether that's a standalone building replacing the, 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 the common facility right now, which is conceptually a great idea, but physically fairly inadequate for, for really being a, a, a community space that, that, that the residents use. So yes, we talked about it. Um, again, in the implementation phase, that's one of the strategic questions that needs to be answered by campus. Do we in integrate that or not? Who else has a question? I saw a hand raised back there. Yes. So, in, in this, you talk about um, some of the shortages. What, what would be the total number of beds that you would be bringing from the community? Uh, so, so, the question was uh, what is the, the, the shortage in beds and uh, what would be the total amount of housing on campus should we implement everything? Um, so, Mike, maybe you can remember those numbers. I could probably flip back to that slide, but. <laughs> Adding 600 beds to the existing uh, amount of beds on campus is, pardon me, 2,500. 2, Thank you. Yes. So, at what point, so if we stand pat, at what point do you see us running into trouble? Whether or not being able to house what we need, or not being able to build the facilities that'll do what we need to do. Uh, my, my opinion about uh, last January, but um, I'll let Mike answer too. Okay, so that that question was about at what point, if you don't do anything, do you start running into trouble in terms of being able to house the students that want to be housed? There's a simple answer to that, and then there's a more complicated answer to that. If the priority is to house first-year students, and you're only looking at filling beds with first-year students, then you're not in trouble for quite a long time because you can always just reduce and reduce and reduce the amount of returning students you allow back in. The problem you create is you've only got, you're already pretty much capped out at the number of traditional style first year housing beds that you would want first year students to live in. So you're already in trouble with that, but in terms of giving them a bed, you're not in trouble for quite a long time, although your returning numbers will get lower and lower and lower as you remove them from housing to allow first years to be in housing. So if you're talking about just purely prioritizing first year students to get in, you're fine for a long time. If you're talking about from a student development standpoint, from a likely success standpoint, from an academic retention standpoint, you're already in trouble. Um, and that's why we divided up the demand study. So just look at, if you just wanna prioritize getting the first years up to a point where you're gonna be okay for a while with first year students in housing that is most suitable to first year students, then you've got that number to target. So that means a combination of adding a larger building, and you saw a couple of different options, so that you can over time and phase out some of the smaller buildings and create a building that's more suitable to them. Um, but then you've also got that issue of you have an awful lot of students that want to live on campus that you basically have to say no to. And that number is likely to go up, if anything else, because as you improve the first year housing, you're gonna make their experience even better than it is right now in buildings that aren't the greatest. They were, they were fine when they were built, but they're, you know, they were built to, be, to last a certain amount of time and we're at that time. So if you make new first year housing that as well as, and combine that with your management group and your student leaders that are already doing a good job, give them a building that is state of the art to do that good job with, your returning numbers are gonna go up even more. So, so the short answer is, if it's just about a bed, you're not in trouble for a long time. If it's about a bed and a traditional housing that you would want first year students to be in, you're already there.
All right, the question was uh, a little bit more clarity as to what buildings are remaining and which ones are new. So maybe it'd be easiest to just go back to one of the options here. Did you want me to go through both options or just one of them to explain a little? Okay, whoops, here we are. Okay, so one, you're not losing any buildings. There's that open space between, I call it the ecumenical center, that's probably not the current name for it, that's the old name, uh, that and the current of high property. All the current of high properties right here, there's the ecumenical center. And this is basically a parking lot right now. So we'd be putting the first freshman residence hall right there, about 400 beds. Now, right in this location, there are some of high buildings right now. So in the second phase, what would happen is you'd build this building first, then you'd get some it, you know, new freshmen coming in to stay in those beds, but then you'd also move some of these students into here as surge space. Then you'd remove those buildings and build a new residence hall there. So that takes you through that freshman need, right, right in the center. And then all these other buildings on the current of high property and all the uh, older buildings up on Walter Way, all that remains. Then when you get to the third phase, you know, again there, here, let me go back. You know, we'd build this building, right? And these buildings that would be removed in the next phase, we'd have to use some of this again as a little bit of surge space, right? So you have somewhere for them to go. Then you'd remove those, that first half of those buildings on Walter Way, build another sophomore residence hall in, in this option, right? And then again, you kind of use that as surge space. Then you'd remove these buildings and then build another residence hall right up in that location. And then again, you know, we have a little bit of surge space to accommodate removing some of these buildings for the final phase of this option, right? Which was the uh, juniors and seniors. And then you'd build that new facility in this location. And by that time, you'd have everybody housed and then you've created all those green spaces that they would then develop. Did that? So you would be removing the one floor and the end of nine additional Over time, yes, correct. Not all at once, but it would be over a longer period of time. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a parking lot there, there right now. And then, you know, we'd accommodate the parking, you know, in some of those periphery spaces as well. Right. Paul mentioned it's really important then, you know, what we're doing this first phase and those phasing, we're always creating that surge space. So we have that little bit of capacity to move the older or the, the residents that are staying in those older buildings that we plan to remove get them into that new building, remove those older buildings, then build a new building and keep going in that stepwise fashion. So the question was uh, asking for more clarity on what sort of uh, common area social spaces would be built uh, inside the new building. Um, and you specifically asked about the first year buildings? Okay. So um, again, um, w we weren't tasked with designing a building for this study, but in terms of doing the, the building layouts, um, we had to accommodate, make some assumptions about what what, why that footprint is the size and shape it is. And so typically what we would do is, is have a, a, a lounge space on each floor that is, is provided for community uh, formation for a house, uh, you know, 30 to 40 students. Um, and so in that particular configuration, you can imagine a house in each wing. So on those upper floors, there'd be a, a, a community space, a lounge in each of those wings. And then um, on the first floor, we would have a larger space, which would be a hall type of community space so that there's that ability to, 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 to form that community, community in the hall itself as well as those individual houses. Okay. Can I have one more thing? 
Yeah, you bet. <clears throat> In, in addition to that, when we did the floor, uh, the square footage modeling for the for the financial modeling, we also factored in that there would be some dedicated study space within the building. So it would be, and those spaces are they're usually typically the same footprint of a space, but then the students would kind of work it out and based with the staff. Like so, there'll be some rooms that will be designed for group work. There'll be some rooms that'll be designed for individual work, you know, that kind of thing. So those would also be spread through spread throughout the building. And if you think of those floor lounges, if you think of kind of a great room concept, so where you've got the ability to cook within that room. So the idea of having, when you have a, a small cooking facility within a traditional residence now, um, a lot of the older ones, it's kind of tucked off in a corner or something like that. It's just a place to go and do it. But this is bringing that into the space. So the lounge space is part of where the, the, uh, the cooking area would be with multiple cooktops. So people could cook at the same time together. Um, putting some study, putting some tables that can be multiple multiple purposes for studying, for eating, depending on the time of day, time of year. You know, the typical big TV so you can watch the Vikings beat the Packers. Oh, no, huh? Jeez. That actually got way less reaction than I thought it was going to get. Okay. So you've got that, the typical, you know, all come together for the big game or the big movie or the, whatever the TV show that is on at that time. And then some study spaces spread around. And then, like Jonathan mentioned, usually a bigger common space that can bring everyone together somewhere. Uh, I just want to clarify that Mike is a hockey fan from Canada, so you know take take the Packers Viking thing with a grain of sand or salt. Uh, other questions? Yes. So to paraphrase the question on the uh, uh, options that were public-private partnerships, uh, uh, who owns that building ultimately? Is it the uh, 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 the university or is it uh, the private developer? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Those were modeled off of um, my memory is serving me right off of a 40-year land lease for the building so the company the partner that would be with it if it wasn't of high that was doing the building if it was a partnership with of high as you know in a traditional model of high acting kind of as the university kind of thing so it'd be the land lease that company would uh have the building and operate the building for the 40 years and then the building would go over to the landowner which if it's on of high land would be of high if it was on different land then it would be the university No, the the rates aren't really don't really work like that. Um, it's a good way to explain this without sounding like a commercial for us. Um, a lot of campuses that go into a P3 organ operation and they want to pursue that, they'll hire a company to serve as their advisor to run the procurement process with them. Obviously, working with the university's procurement policies, you know, not violating rules and things. But part of the deal will be setting it up so there are controls related to what the rents are being charged. So it's not just they get to build the building and then charge whatever they want to. It's no, like here are the, here's the range of the rents we need to be in. And then there's usually restrictions around um, it can't be priced more than X percent related to the property, to the residences that are on the state land. So there's usually restrictions around that, um, as well as they can't undercut it. And so there's controls around what those rates are. So that all gets negotiated through the advisory process and the procurement process. So I, and to be honest, that's where it's, that's literally how Scion's company got started, was helping schools do those kind of deals 20 years ago. And so whether you hire Scion or you work with somebody else, I would really strongly suggest that if that's a road you're gonna go down, is hiring a private and independent firm to help you through the advising process to get the deal because the developers as much as they want it to succeed they're going to be coming at it from their end as like here's the best deal and it may sound like a great deal but there may be details that you haven't experienced in, from other places so I'd really suggest an advisor whether it's us or somebody else but yeah there are controls built in to arrange the rates uh, in a way that matches up with the rest of the campus.
Uh, that question was about the, the sheet showing it done through an UFI model and done through um, a DFDM model. Um, yeah, those are the only two we did. The, you have to keep in mind the UFI process is a P3 process, and it's, I, yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, so if there was a, a P3 on a P3, that would be a different process. And then it also relates to very much to the standard to which you build the buildings. Because that of high model that was shown was built to, was done based on the standards to which the current of high models or of high buildings are built. Um, yeah, if you, if you ask me as someone who used to be a housing director, I would say boost the standards up a little bit. You don't need to go to something that's going to need to be there for 100 years. but. Um, a little bit sturdier than what what they are now and also making a little bit bigger which means you almost by necessity have to make it to a higher standard um, but those were based on the the construction style that's in place right now Last chance? we 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 have another uh, 55 minutes to sit here, so, <laughs> no? Okay. All right, I just wanted to wrap this up. Um, I want to say thank you to Jonathan and to Mike and to Paul and Jared uh, for putting together this presentation and, and all the work that they've done, and, and Chelsea and Molly and, and everybody on their staff. Um, done a good job, a lot of time is spent. Also want to thank um, our, the core team, uh, steering committee, you know, Gail, uh, in housing and Cheryl and Jeff, uh, Eric, and then uh, Keith from the Yove High Board. And of course, everybody at UW Green Bay, um, everybody that's been a part of this and gave some good input. Uh, the surveys that were done, very helpful um, in the long range uh, to move us forward. Uh, this this uh, product will be incorporated into our campus master plan update. Uh, that was finished in 2006. We're going to be starting that um, hopefully in the next year or so, or uh, 2019, and and we want to uh, incorporate a lot of these these measures into that as we continue to grow the university. Um, so with that, I'm going to say we're finished. Okay. <laughs>